So thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to be on this seminar series. Um, I have to apologize uh, in advance that I'm at home, of course, at this time on Friday night in Israel. So there's only one door between me and the chaos of the family. So I hope it won't interrupt us uh, too much. And I was uh, discussing with uh, the organizers what kind of topic to discuss with you, to present to you, and they chose this topic, which is unusual for this seminar series so far, which uh, mostly dealt with uh, uh, cell scale um, biological physics. And just to let you know that we are also interested in cell scale biological physics, I'll just show you this uh, advertisement slide to send you to the archive paper at the bottom where we're interested in how cells get their shapes and maybe can convert even to a motile shape uh, due to curved proteins that um, recruit the cytoskeleton. So um, the, the subject of this talk is uh, swarms, but in general, um, you can ask why, why is it uh, interesting to think about collective uh, animal behavior in terms of physics? So it's similar to statistical physics in the sense that you have a large number of interacting entities. Uh, they are self-propelled, which means that they fall within this realm of um, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics or active matter. Um, and this actually appears on all scales in biology, not just with animal flocks. And we had works in the past dealing with um, uh, traffic jams of molecular motors within cellular protrusions, as shown in this sort of uh, very quick advertisement. Or on a larger scale, you can have collective migration of many, many cells that are moving in a two-dimensional monolayer, which is expanding and actually even uh, experiencing these instabilities, which are shown here in the simulations as these fingering instabilities, which are also observed in experiments. Um, so collective behavior or many, many entities which are seemingly very close to each other behaving collectively as a group appears on all scales in, in um, biology and we have been involved in many of these scales. Um, the first work which we did on collective animal behavior actually was started with Offer Feynman in the Weizmann Institute, which dealt with how groups of ants collectively transport a, a piece of food, which one of them cannot actually uh, move at all to the nest. And you can see some fun experiments and a simulation. Uh, this is in particular a fun experiments which shows you um, ants um, becoming a pendulum. It's not a working clock, but it's, uh, it's fun to actually write the equations which are similar to um, a real pendulum in gravity. That's why the image is tilted like that to um, uh, suggest gravity, but actually real gravity is something that I will tell you today, and that is um, with um, uh, our, the introduction to swarms. So there are generally two classes of um, behavior of groups of animals. So it is the more common uh, uh, behavior, which you are uh, more familiar with because it's very striking, your flocking of birds or schooling of fish. Uh, or people in a concert or a wildebeest in the savanna, you have short range interactions between the, the um, entities, between the individual animals. And there is a clear order parameter, which is a global polarization of the group as it is moving together towards um, its destination, be it a foraging area for uh, food or for nesting or whatever. Uh, the other behavior of collective um, behavior of groups of animals is swarming, as shown here, for example, in this still image of a swarm of midges, which will be the subject of my talk. Um, and on the face of it, it looks just like a mess. There's nothing really so striking about it. It just looks like a big mess. There's no clear order parameter. Um, and maybe there is room for long range interactions. Who knows? It looks very cohesive. Nothing really needs to be done here um, very quickly. So maybe they can assess more generally the larger scale structure of this uh, entity. So when you go to the park, usually at dusk or at dawn, you see these groups of midges um, which are swarming uh, above your heads and they come in, in all sizes. Sometimes they contain many thousands. Um, why do they swarm? They're all males. Of course, I knew nothing about them before I was introduced to the subject a few years ago. Um, and they swarm together because they live for only a day or, or just a day or two, and they need to maximize their chance of mating. So the males make these big swarms and the females go through this swarm at a higher velocity and therefore their buzzing noise from their wings 
it has a slightly different frequency, the males can detect that frequency and chase them, and the lucky one mates with the female, and then they, they die. Um, so, by the way, they make a, a astonishing images uh, at night if you take pictures of them with a, with a flashlight. And this was actually an image that was sent to me by this guy, Avichai Ran, from uh, the north of Israel just last week because he saw uh, a popular science article about this work. So whether they are flying fairies or not, I leave it to your imagination, but I think these are quite striking images. So they are very different, as we said, from, from the flocking, because in the flock, you can actually um, uh, employ as, a, as an animal a very simple set of rules. Just follow anybody else, everybody else that you see, be it the, your close neighbors or everybody that you see within some, some radius. And uh, therefore, simple uh, agent-based rules actually reproduce this behavior very well. And um, the, the sort of archetyp archetypical name for them is Vicek type for Tamas Vicek, who started this kind of modeling uh, about 20 years ago. And essentially, between each individuals, there's a kind of orientational ordering so that the velocities are tending to order in the same direction. And that's a very simple rule to employ. And within, with an algorithm, you can show that it gives the same striking behavior that you observe in nature. Now, in the swarm, um, there's no obvious order parameter because they're they are going all over the place. So you can ask what actually keeps them cohesive um, and what theoretical model should we actually uh, uh, think of in order to describe this thing. And finally, I hope I will get to it at the end of the talk, is that about five years ago, it was observed that within this mess, within this chaos, there are transient pairs of two uh, midges that actually come together and sort of form an orbiting pair for uh, a, a significant amount of time. And again, um, do we need uh, elaborate behavioral models so to go into the brain of these animals and consider what could be the evolutionary advantage of coming and forming these pairs, maybe to check on each other, maybe to see if they don't miss a female, or we don't? Can we still explain even that uh, puzzling behavior within the same physics type modeling that should answer the first two uh, uh, bullet points here. So uh, just to remind you, Vichik-like models essentially say that each um, uh, agent um, is influenced by several of its neighbors, let's say within some radius, and it can judge their direction of motion, and it can realign its direction of motion to be um, uh, co-aligned with their mean direction of motion. And there's a nice review of that by Tamas Vichik himself. Um, if you add noise to such a system, you can break this order, and of course, at very high noise, you, the, the, the system disperses into a, a, a gas, but right at the transition point, you can have something which sort of um, looks like a, a disordered um, swarm. But again, it's only based on short range interactions um, or near neighbor interactions. And um, you can actually uh, define this order parameter, which as we said, it's the uh, overall mean um, directionality of the motion of the individual agents. And this is very high for a flock and for a swarm, this is rather low as expected. Um, just to tell you that um, uh, Andrea Cavagna and uh, Irena Giardina, uh, they developed this uh, idea that the swarm is actually behaving according to the Vichik model at the critical point. And they, they could explain several uh, uh, observed um, uh, similarities, but not all the swarm properties. And I should uh, say that this is still a very beautiful piece of work. And Giardina recently got uh, a prize from the APS uh, for that work. Um, so the, the, my, my work on, on this swarm started by meet, meeting um, uh, Nick Ouellet, who at the time was um, in Yale, but now he's in Stanford already for several years. And he actually recreates these, um, these swarms in the lab. So if you can see, this is, for example, a movie of such a swarm in Nick's lab. Now, necessarily, they are much, much smaller than the swarms in the parks. At the most, he got up to a few tens or up to a hundred of midges in the swarm. Uh, by the way, the midges themselves, they are non-biting midges. So they are, not, they are similar to mosquitoes, but they don't have to be scared that they will transmit any diseases to you. 
Um, and by the advantage of working in the lab, uh, there's Nick in the picture and uh, his um, uh, students and postdocs in, 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 that used to be in his lab for the years that we worked together. Um, they could actually film the trajectories of these midges and get exquisite data about the location, the velocity and acceleration of these midges. Okay, so when I met uh, Nick, we started uh, discussing this uh, idea that maybe we could think of these um, uh, systems as actually uh, being held together, that the cohesive interactions between them is actually long range, maybe acoustic, but maybe also by visual plus acoustic, but at least long range and that it is adaptive or fault change detection. Now I'll explain what that means. And the first paper was in 2016 and uh, Dan Gorbonos, who used to be a postdoc of mine at that time and is now in Ian Cousins group in, uh, in uh, Constance. So what does it mean acoustic interaction? First of all, do they, um, can they detect acoustic uh, noise? Yes, they have this big uh, feather-like um, uh, organ on their heads, which allows them to actually detect noise. And we will assume that they can detect not only the amplitude of the noise, but also the directionality of the noise. Of course, we will assume that they can do that perfectly. And in, in reality, of course, there's more complications, but that will be the simplifying assumptions we will use. So the sound uh, intensity decays as one over R squared, or even faster, if uh, as a faster power law, if it's a higher multiple, but it doesn't actually really, uh, all the results that I will show you don't actually really depend if it's exactly R to the power of two, or R to the power of three, or R to the power of 2.5. So, um, to simplify the analysis, we thought about it as one over R squared, because then it's really like uh, gravity. And we like things which are similar because there's lots of results about gravity, which we can use. So the assumption, the main assumption of the model is that the acceleration of each of these midges towards a source of this noise, or be it a visual attraction, which represents for this midge, a fellow male midge, is an attraction which goes like an acceleration which goes like one over R squared. So that's exactly what you get in if there, if there are two masses attracting each other by Newtonian gravity. So it is up to now, as I write in this equation, exactly like an acoustic type of gravity. So they are completely attracting to each other uh, with a directionality that goes to the distance, uh, to, the, to the direction towards each source and divided by the distance squared. Um, but there is adaptivity, and adaptivity means that all our sensory uh, systems, be it from the bacteria that senses the glucose level in the, in the surrounding uh, um, uh, medium, or to you listening to me now or viewing the world around you, you can actually adapt the sensitivity of your sensory system due to the background overall intensity that you're receiving. So it means that, in, in other words, it means that if you go into a noisy room, your sensitivity goes down. If you go to a quiet room, your sensitivity goes up. So you are tuning your sensitivity based on the background level. And the advantage of that, of course, is that it increases immensely the dynamic range within which your sensory system can work. And that's, of course, one advantage that um, regular cameras and microphones that we build don't have. And that's why they have a very limited dynamical range. And there's a nice review by Uri Alon of, this, uh, of these ideas uh, from uh, just uh, two, two years ago. Okay. Um, so basically, it means that we take the regular gravity and we modify it by uh, dividing this uh, vectorial sum to each of the sources by this um, background noise, which, which is denoted by I. And this background noise is nothing but the, um, the scalar sum of just the amplitude, just the intensities of all the noise that, that this midge gets from all the others and therefore, we call this the total background sound. So this is the total background sound intensity that it is actually uh, uh, measuring. And this RAD here is a, a measure of the distance over which you can actually um, perfectly adapt for these dis differences in, uh, in the background noise that come from a point source. And beyond that, you can actually do not, uh, you're not able to adapt anymore. 
But if you look at this, if you take this RAD to be very large, it essentially means that you're in the perfect adaptivity, which means that this vectorial sum is perfectly divided by the scalar sum. Um, so adaptive gravity, as I said, is basically to take gravity and multiply it by this or divide it by this uh, scalar sum. So this is perfect adaptivity shown here in the limit of this RAD going to infinity. Some ideas of that sort were, were thought about by mathematicians working about um, thinking about flocks, but not in the context of this um, uh, swarming and, and gravity-like interactions. So again, when the total noise is high, the sensitivity is reduced. Um, and this immediately breaks all that you know about pairwise interactions. So there's no more any more uh, um, uh, conservation of uh, momentum or energy. The only conserved uh, uh, thing that we are re remaining with in this swarm is mass because particles don't get created or annihilated. But because there's now not any more reciprocity reciprocity between uh, two particles because what they feel depends on their local environment which is different between any any two of them all of these um, uh, conservations uh, are thrown out of the window and of course that's a big problem when you try to write some analytic theory for this uh, kind of uh, system um, so just last year, we published a work which actually looked more closely on the um, large scale uh, properties of these uh, swarms and specifically compared them to what is already known with regular gravity about what is called isothermal globular clusters, which are shown here in the background. So that's one globular cluster. It contains millions of stars. Each of these dot uh, points of light are, are stars like our sun. And these are uh, these globular clusters are some of the oldest structures in the in the universe. They are uh, uh, dispersed throughout uh, the Milky Way uh, galaxy. You can think of them as like mini galaxies in some sense. So if one looks, for example, at analytic solution of the of using regular gravity of the density distribution from the center of such a globular cluster outwards. And this is a log scale of the density. You see that they specifically don't have a Gaussian. They do have a Gaussian like um, a density profile when they are very small, but as soon as you make them larger, they begin to develop these power low uh, tails. And this is from the experimental swarm. So again, you see that they do develop this power, something that looks like a large uh, tail as you make the number of particles larger in the swarm. But again, just to remind you, these swarms are still only between 10 and something like 80, um, and not, not more than that. That's the limitation of these experiments. If you want to look at uh, further distributions like the probability density to get some um, velocity within the cloud, like you have in an experiment where again, with increasing size, there was a larger and larger deviation from this Gaussian distribution, we now resort to simulations. And this is a simulation with now with the adaptive gravity and you can see that we recover the same kind of qualitative trends that are observed in the experiment. Another actually very a curious feature in the experiment, which is shown here on the left panel, is that the speed of the individual um, um, uh, midges was flat as function of distance. Now you could say, well, that's not surprising, because they are self-propelled particles and they are not in fact really accelerating by gravity or by this effective force that you assume. So that, that's not surprising that they have a perfect flat uh, uh, velocity, but don't forget that the, their velocity is not in fact completely constant as shown by this distribution. So they do, they can speed up and slow down. So the fact that the mean velocity is independent of location is surprising because under gravity, there is a reduction in velocity as you go away from the center of the cloud. And that's actually very, uh, maybe many of you know that if you have a spiral galaxy, the first signs of, of, uh, of dark matter were the fact that this velocity uh, um, velocity graphs were flat as function of distance. But in fact, in the theory, if we simulate with adaptive gravity, unlike these simulation points, which are shown here, and the analytic theory of regular gravity, which show a clear, a clear reduction in speed with distance, if we make a simulation with adaptive gravity, it looks rather flat. So there is no need for dark matter 
in these uh, systems, in order to explain the flat velocity curve, it comes naturally because of adaptivity. Essentially, it means that when you're close to the center, you are feeling the interactions much less because there's a high background of noise, and therefore you're in a region where your sensitivity goes down and all your accelerations are lower, while if you're outside, the background noise is, is, is smaller when you're on the outer reaches of the swarm here, and that's why your sensitivity goes up and that compensates for lo the lower density. Um, now, the, 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 the strongest uh, evidence that we had so far from these large-scale features that our model could be the correct model for the swarm is that if you look at the mean acceleration that a midge feels towards the center of the swarm as function of distance away from the swarm, you see that these are rather linear lines. These are from experiments. And the larger is the swarm, the slope of this line actually becomes shallower. Now, a, a, a linear line of acceleration as a function of distance, that's like a spring, right? And a flatter, a, a flatter graph means a shallower spring constant. And that's exactly what we get in adaptive gravity. And with regular gravity, all of these lines should have been with the same slope, independent of the size of how large you make the, the, um, the swarm if the concentration of the swarm in the density in the swarm center doesn't change much, which, it's, which it doesn't. And Here, we sorry, can explain- I just wanted to mention yeah. a three, three, minute, three minute warning. Okay, so we just uh, okay. So I just I just rush here. I'll just say that this was the strongest evidence that we had so far, and it comes if you are, take you to your undergrad that if you throw a mass through the center of the Earth, it actually behaves like a restoring spring in the center. Okay, so this was a very strong uh, uh, proof that maybe we're on the right track, and you can see that the experimental data uh, um, observed the one over. RS, which is the radius of the swarm that was predicted by the model. But uh, I think that the nicest thing, which I have very little time to tell you about, is about this pair formation. And this came out also last year. And it started with an observation that uh, Nick already published in 2015, but remained unexplained. And he saw that within this chaos of the swarm, a pair of midges, here is the distance between them, from time to time came into a close orbit with each other. These are these two uh, uh, purple ones, which towards the end of this short movie, which is from the experiment, they form a close uh, bound pair. And why would this pairing be, behave, uh, happen? And do we need new behavioral rules in order to make it happen? So I just quickly, and that's another example from an experiment where the distance between two of them really begins to oscillate for a certain period of time as they form this bound pair. So I'll quickly show you maybe this movie. So this is a simulation with regular gravity, and I don't think you see any pairing. And this is a simulation with uh, adaptive gravity. And I think you can really see very quickly with the eye that they do form these long-lived pairs, which can actually tr transverse the, the whole cloud several times without breaking up, even triplets sometimes. And that's already striking. And I can just tell you that with regular gravity, it's very difficult for two masses to catch each other. Because of conservation of mass, sorry, conservation of energy and momentum, you need a third mass to take away the surplus energy and momentum in order to make them bound into a pair. And that almost never happens. You can, now you can then tell me, ah, but most suns in the galaxy are in fact in binaries, but they are in binaries because they just simply collapse from an oval initial cloud. So they are not capturing each other. And ho and behold, if you run the, the simulation of adaptive gravity, we do get exactly such transient pairs, which form a, a close bound with a high frequency, much higher frequency of oscillation uh, during this pairing region. So very, very similar to the observations. And I will just jump to explain you what happens. What happens is that when two of them are in the middle of the cloud and they are close to each other enough and they're moving out, they go from a low sensitivity region with high background to a high sensitivity region with low background. And that's exactly when they bound together because suddenly they find each other in a region where their interactions is becoming stronger and stronger and it just binds them into a pair. And of course, if you reverse that process, you can actually break them up. So we understand the mechanism by which they actually form this pairing 
and I'll even show you that quantitatively the percentage of pairs, which is about 15% in the, in the experiments, is actually roughly reproduced by the simulations without any fitting parameters because we're in the strong adaptivity limit. So we actually predict even a higher pairing uh, percentage because we have no noise. Um, let me just jump to the summary. So I would say that uh, the idea is that they are interacting through an effective interactions, which is like adaptive gravity. Of course, it goes through the cognition or the, the reflexes, but it goes through the neural system of, the, of this insect. It's, it's, it's still a living animal. It's not really with gravitational interactions, but it looks like gravitational interactions. And, uh, and adaptivity is, of course, playing a key role in explaining uh, how the, the, uh, how this remains cohesive and has its uh, global properties. And what is even, I think, even more beautiful is that they, this same rule of adaptive gravity can actually explain how they form these transient pairs without the need to invoke any new behavioral rules, like they come close to each other to check up on each other or anything like that, which might be true, but you don't need any of that, those psychological explanations. Physics does everything for you. <laughs> so at least on that on that level. So um, yeah, I would just say that maybe um, you know adaptive long range interactions can appear in other uh, regimes, like for example, in swarming of, of single cells to a wound, and maybe also there you get these transient pairing. I don't know, but the same rules should apply to other systems and not only to midges. Um, and yeah, and thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mir, for that really interesting talk. There's tons of questions um, in the chat. So let's start. Uh, let's see how many we can get through in the next couple of minutes. So the first question from Francis Cavana is, is this acoustic attraction specific for a particular frequency? For example, male midges attracts to female midges. So, so we know that they are attracting, attracted to male midges because the swarm itself is, is composed of males, but it's true that they're even more attracted to the higher frequency that the females emit because they are flying simply faster, usually. So while they are uh, attracted to other males, they never come uh, they never come into contact with other males, so they keep their distance, but they are attracted generally. Um, so there is like a short range repulsion between them. They don't actually um, uh, go on top of each other, which is also, again, not the same thing as gravity, which does bring masses together. Um, but, uh, but with a female, which is a different frequency, they know to behave differently. They know to try to chase her and to actually, uh, you know, link with her and then they drop off the swarm. Yeah. Uh, another question related to the interactions is, is there direct experimental evidence of insects using acoustics regarding their flight? So um, this is a good question. I know that there are experiments with uh, flies, which show that they can uh, acoustically uh, interact with each other and also um, you know, um, avoid uh, predation. The, it's known that there are uh, moths that are uh, tuned to the uh, bats, uh, ultrasound to uh, avoid predation by bats, and the same with um, trying to avoid predation by frogs. Um, they, they, they are crickets and many other insects that use noise and, and sound in order to attract uh, mates. Um, now for these particular flying midges, uh, I think the verdict is still um, uncertain. They do have these organs that allow them to hear sound. They do respond to the higher frequency of the females. Um, and I think uh, Nick has done a few experiments, but I would say not exhaustive, uh, that show, for example, that you, if you increase the background noise, um, the whole swarm um, expands, which is um, in qualitative agreement with this model, because if the background noise increases, then uh, as we said, due to adaptivity, the strength of their reactions weakens, and therefore it's like a weakening of their uh, gravitational attraction, and therefore the whole thing should expand in, in, in volume. There's a paper of Nick that just came out uh, in the past uh, month. Um, so uh, I would say this is still an open research question. 